Hello and welcome to Oakville Matters. Our city calls itself a town and always feels like a village when you meet folks halfway. Today, we're gonna to look for answers to the questions on many parents' minds about schools with Ontario's Minister of Education, Stephen Lachick. Thank you, Stephen, for your, or Minister, for your service to the province and our community and for joining us today. You're such a personable person. I I flipped up, I slipped up there and called you by your first name instead of your title. I beg you, I beg your pardon for that. Well, I invited right. you. I invited you thinking that we have something in common. I became mayor because our town wasn't keeping up with growth. We didn't have the parks, the playing fields, the arenas, the rec centers, the libraries, and the schools that we should have had. I've built and am building what we need to keep up with growth, but I can't build schools. You are the first Minister of Education who has really gotten significant numbers of new schools built in Oakville. And for that, I have to give you a big thank you. And of course, I also have to say, please, sir, can we have some more? <laughs> we, we are a very fast growing place to live. We attract people from all over the world and you are a fast builder of schools. Will you be able to keep up with our growth? Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, Your Worship, or Rob, uh, as I will refer to you henceforth. Uh, but look, um, you know, we have an important job in our collaboration at the provincial municipal levels. And I will say it's a pleasure working with you uh, and your council under your leadership. And frankly, because of the strong MPPs we have across Holtz, and we've been able to deliver some positive outcomes. I mean, to contextualize this, folks, we're talking about $114 million of capital investment to build new schools, net new schools, for families in Oakville over the past five years. We're averaging a school a year. Um, and as the mayor has rightfully noted, that is, is um, unprecedented. And I appreciate there's more we're gonna do together. My aim is to build schools where the growth necessitated. I don't think it is in the interest of the community, of the environment, of local traffic and quality of life uh, of the child to have them bust large distances. Let's build schools in communities where there is growth. Oakville is no exception. It is the case study how to do it. And I must say, it couldn't have been done if we didn't have a good partner on the ground. Uh, we build a lot of schools all over Ontario. It doesn't take two years on average to build in other communities. It doesn't do worse. And for that, I want to reciprocate my, the gratitude shared saying, look, it, it takes a village and we're doing this together and we're doing it for the benefit of young families uh, across Oakville and uh, North Burlington and frankly right across Ontario. Well, I can tell you, we certainly appreciate it here. And uh, the implicit promise there that uh, you'll keep doing it is very, very uh, welcome to hear. Uh, it makes me hope that you'll stay Minister of Education for a very long time. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tease you about that in just a second. The first thing I learned preparing for our talk is six Ontario ministers of education went on to become premier, including Bill Davis. Now, he was one of the most affable and funny individuals that I've ever met. Does, does that record of ministers of education going on, does that keep you going in your job? I think my, what my motivator is the young people I serve, uh, not the future ambitions in the, the world of politics. I mean, I am so overwhelmed as a son of immigrants, uh, you know, reasonably young-ish age to be given a position of authority to make a difference in the lives of families and, and students in Ontario. That's my why. Uh, that's my, it's my presence. It's what motivates me every day. I have nieces and a new, uh, soon to be two-year-old nephew who will be entering our Catholic schools. I want them to enter with confidence that one day uh, when they graduate, they'll have the skills to get them a good job and the life and dignity of these so true opportunities. I'm very proud of our country. I think we still have a lot to be grateful for. And I, uh, I won't give up on this generation. I, I know I hear too much uh, people giving up, uh, losing hope. And I think for me, if we all in public service can motivate our peers and our young people to believe in Canada and in freedom and democracy and, and, and the opportunities, the prosperity that is shared in Canada, I think I think I'm convinced young people will carry on the heritage of Canada, which is leaving the generation, uh, the next generation, better off than one prior. I saw your one-minute video reading to the graduates in June, and I have to say that was one of the most inspirational messages in only a minute. Uh, it was, I guess, it was written and delivered in a way that might actually get the attention of uh, eighteen-year-olds. Yeah, I, I think. 
I think you and I, uh, you know, given the, our historic verbosity on there, we're challenged in 60 seconds. Okay, this is very difficult for me. I'm not going to suggest that was my first take, but I think it's important we reach people in the audiences and the platforms they're engaging with. So for young people, short and punchy messages that I think can try to inspire them to never give up. I mean, I invoke Winston Churchill, uh, you know, as a student of history, recognizing his message in the, in the, the greatest period one of the greatest darkness in human history um, for him to motivate a nation and a broader democratic movement to keep fighting for good, uh, I think for me is a, a compelling case study for why we must never give up now in the, in the crazy world we live today. And I think young people are depending on us to have that resilience and that focus and determination. I think it, it can be infectious. So uh, let's all continue to rise to the challenge as I know you're doing, sir, uh, and we'll continue to do the province. Well, it's a relief to learn that it wasn't take one. For When I saw it, I thought, oh, he's a natural born communicator. So uh, the other thing I learned about you is that uh, you've been Minister of Education for four years. Your anniversary was June 20th, just uh, a month ago. Uh, do you feel that such a long run has uh, given you, let me break my question in half here. There is a very popular book for people on boards and government agencies who are trying to you know, roll the rock up the hill, try to make things better. It's called uh, From Good to Great. And one of the key things in that recipe is to be around long enough to not only devise a plan, but then to work it, to work it through. Is, is that a consolation to you for being Minister of Education for so long? You actually have the opportunity to be implementing a good to great plan? Well, I'm, I'm a big believer in the Jim Collins principle. It's a great book. Uh, and I, I do believe we could, I will be, I can certainly be better, which is why I strive for excellence in what I do. And, um, you know, the mission in the ministry for me is really to see young people achieve using metrics that we can measure uh, better outcomes on reading, writing, and math, higher performance in the fundamental skills, a greater understanding of the world and the changing and rather disrupted economy around us when it comes to embracing AI and coding and technological innovation. I mean, my broad vision for young people in this province is to graduate technologically savvy, emotionally intelligent, ambitious, proud Canadians who are ready for the jobs of tomorrow. People who understand the marketplace will change and so must the curriculum and what we learn in our schools. And I think the life and job skills we have infused into the curriculum will help young people gain that competitive advantage when you compare them to their peers in Canada and around the world. I want young Ontarians to be a go-to destination for the best and brightest. And I believe we have that talent. It is now our objective to nurture it, to grow it, to help, as you say, really inspire that vertical growth to continue to improve. And I think what we're doing in our publicly funded school system is achieving that. I do believe we've got to keep reforming the system to ensure we deliver on that imperative. But our greatest asset is our young people. They are dynamic. They are diverse. Uh, they are good citizens. I think overwhelmingly they uh, are raised with values that unite us as Canadians. And uh, I really want to serve them. I want them to know they're my primary audience, uh, notwithstanding all the noise on Twitter and all the comments and perspectives one may have. The audience, the sort of my boss, if you will, in addition to being the premier, it really is the people of Ontario and these young people. I say that you may not vote, but I want you to know you have my attention like no other. Um, and I think that sort of gives them a sense of, you know, okay, I, I, have some, I have some authority. The guy cares about what I have to say. He meets with me. And sometimes these often small acts could have big impact on a young person. I'll never forget Al Paladini, a name you will recall from the past, former transportation minister under Premier Harris. And, you know, I was a young guy, I was 12 years old, 12, 13, and, and he took an interest in me and he had no reason to. My parents were not connected, they were not political, they were not donors, they just, I'm just, you know, Italian immigrants, kid that took an interest in politics for some reason. Uh, I wasn't raised with it at the dinner table. And he, with all the things happening in his life, personally, professionally, and big macro infrastructure investments, he took time to get to know me. And it's like, you know, it's these types of experiences that can be life changing. And for me, it was. So uh, I want to continue to have that impact on young people and recognize that they're the people that I serve. And they're the ones I have in mind when I make the decisions every day. 
Well, I have a personal motto uh, for life, which is engage and expand. And you're the first person I've met who best fits that. I think you might fit that better than I do. So, uh, you know, I know the story about you as a student leader at the University of Western Ontario and the uh, prime minister of the day taking a similar kind of interest in you. So yes. there's, there's, there's clearly something engaging going on with you. I would ask you uh, four questions. And uh, these are my favorite questions. Uh, what are you proudest of so far in your plan? What will you be proudest of when you're done? What frustrates you most in your job? And what keeps you up at night? You can take those in any order and you can ignore anyone you don't want to answer. Well, um, <clears throat> the first one I think really focus on our, our the, the element of pride. Uh, we have overhauled Ontario's curriculum. This is an area that doesn't get necessarily a ton of attention in the media, but let me be clear, it is perhaps the most important act a Minister of Education can undertake to ensure that the curriculum is aligned with the labor market, to ensure what we actually teach young people is aligned with the skill sets and competencies they need to get a job. And I find that when we looked at the former math or science or language curriculum, they were 10 and 15 and 14 years respectively out of date. And you think, my goodness, you know, how could a math curriculum not mention AI? How could a math curriculum not require young people to cope? How could there not be mandatory financial learning in every single grade in an age appropriate way starting in grade one? But this is what many of our advanced economies, particularly in the Asia Pacific, were contemplating and really embracing in Europe as well. And I thought we've got to move where the puck is going when it comes to the economy. There's such mass disruption in how we build, how we create, how we innovate. And yet we're teaching things uh, in 1998. And I thought this is so unjust for a young person. And then we ask this rhetorical question. I hear so many parents, why is my kid living in my basement? Or why is my kid unable to get a good job? It isn't their fault. I fundamentally believe it's not, you know, every generation I've heard, we've heard this expression for years, uh, people pining on, on this generation. It's not this generation's fault. If the curriculum and the skills are not are most relevant. So the greatest sense of pride I undertake when we built, when we brought in Bill 98, the Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act, it is driven, it is predicated on the belief of modernization, of alignment with what matters in the economy, and putting life and job skills, transferable skills, hands-on learning experiences into the curriculum as we people. And finally, Ontario is one of the only jurisdictions that will code from grade one through nine. They're teaching financial literacy and basic money skills. They teach how to pay a mortgage and how to save for a house, they talk about taxation and credit. We actually use real budget examples for the, they have to create a real budget for the year after graduation. It's hands-on, it's meant to be exciting. And of course, even our language curriculum being implemented this September, we're gonna to return to phonics and cursive writing and critical thinking skills and digital uh, skills, digital thinking, uh, digital um, uh, um, uh, skill sets that I think are gonna be important in today's world. So that is an area that is important. It's an area that doesn't get a ton of attention, but in the new bill we passed, Bill 98, yeah, it actually now by law, as a matter of statute, requires the Minister of the Day every three years to modernize curriculum so that there's never going to be a day that a future minister comes in saying, oh my goodness, that minister, he left the science curriculum 12 years old or 15 years old like it was for math. Uh, that's important. Um, you uh, posed the question on... Um, um, I think the third question related to uh, uh, how to measure success, is that, is that accurate, sir? No, no, I, I was uh, asking what frustrates you the most in your job? Now, I, it's okay to say nothing frustrates me. Well, you know. It'll well, be a little white lie, I know, but. I think what frustrates a lot of people I speak to, parents, and I'm the same, is I find a lot of bureaucracy systems slow. Uh, oh, and, you know, amen. 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 It's frustrating. I mean, I am from government, and yet I'm not here to defend the slow malaise that it often is reflective of how it takes governments to make decisions and to get things done. I have had to move at record speeds to implement curriculum at a rate that has never been seen in Ontario. Usually, you know, we go through multi-year systems. I mean, we're trying to get new curriculum out in a year cycle. We're trying to build schools in two, two and a half years because we need to meet the needs of the population, not sort of using the metric of what we always did in the past. That's not going to work anymore in a world where the population is increasing by half a million per annum. It's not going to work anymore when we have some of, you know, historic learning loss as a result of the pandemic. We all 
need to work harder and smarter to build better for the people of Ontario. And I'm very committed to, let's say, disrupting those systems. I am okay with that. I appreciate that can be challenging and there's strong aversion to change. And that's the nature of large bureaucracies and systems. But my job is to serve the broader public interest, to stand up for the values of families and taxpayers who demand their, system, their kids get a good education. And they learn in a modern school that isn't overcrowded. And I believe, therefore, we need to use unconventional means and perhaps, um, you know, take a much more a whiteboard approach to how we do things in Ontario, because it is in 1999. Okay, we need to be much more aggressive in our posture. So uh, that's the approach I've taken as minister. And I think most people overwhelmingly are behind that lens of moving quickly, getting things done. Uh, enough with the equivocating, enough with the royal commissions. We know the issues at hand. Reading, writing, and math, the fundamental skill sets have regressed. Let's build plans to improve it. And let's get back to the basics in our schools. Let's make sure young people are, are literate, both financially, in literacy, uh, in civic engagement, online. There's so many areas where they need to be better at. Uh, and that's one area. Uh, and what, I think... What, what about uh, what keeps you up at night? You know, I think... Increasingly, um, I think about this at a much more societal level, the rise, the sharp rise of mental health and violence in society. Uh, it's manifesting in schools. I wouldn't submit that's the, I don't believe that that is the cause, but it is certainly the, um, the casualty often, the rise of mental health uh, addictions. Uh, you know, my own family has seen uh, mental health and addiction issues. And it's just awful. It's very tough on people, very tough on families, very tough on communities. You know, when, when you know, we live in, I'm in Vaughan, uh, you know, I represent King and Vaughan, and you're in Oakville. And, you know, these are, these are good communities, historically safe communities, you know, diverse communities, contrary to what people may think. A lot of diversity and of thought and heritage and faith and experience. It's beautiful. It's amazing. We harness that. But, you know, we're not, we're also not, um, you know, we're not uh, isolated from what's happening in some of the bigger cities. And I think that that reality, that movement concerns me um, and the welfare of people concern me. And so I think governments, uh, decision makers, public office holders, we're going to really have to uh, come up with uh, different ways of tackling what is now a global challenge in communities small and large across Ontario. Um, and I'm seeing, you know, we see challenges in schools too on mental health. And so that's one that bothers me and it concerns me. I'm really, you know, I will say, Mayor, that, you know, we've increased funding in mental health by literally over 500% in schools. And mm -hmm. that gives me a great sense of hope because we're putting the resources there, reducing wait times, increasing access. We, for the first time, did a talk about breaking down bureaucracies and silos. We had a Ministry of Health and Education joint initiative to create a continuum of care so that if a child needs access to a psychologist in September, and they need it all year. Well, under the old system, in June when schools close, so do, so do your school-based mental health workers. And I thought, who created this system? You know, not for the end user, built for a bureaucracy. So we've annualized funding, we've worked with public health, and I'm really proud of those types of common sense approaches. We're making it easier for a child and their families to gain access to support, and frankly, give them a bit of hope that it's okay if they go through these struggles. Many people do, that there is light in this darkness and there's good supports there in school. And our school educators, to their credit, they've done a great deal of professional development to be allies and to be helpful in the classroom. I wanna thank them. Um, but I also recognize that this is an issue we need to tackle as a broader society at all levels of government. Well, I'm, as, a, as, a, as a non-professional, my view of your curriculum changes is that might help as well because uh, a curriculum that gives kids hope that it's practical and and uh, and gives them opportunity mm -hmm. and uh, and a life might help give them the sense of purpose to get through uh, challenges of a mental health nature. Another question that I hear from parents all the time is, what happens on those PD days to make the disruption to the family worth it? Yeah, professional development days. I mean, the ministry funds three per year. Um, you know, school boards decide on the timing and dates of those. Obviously, the aim is to mitigate impact, although there's probably never a day in a, in a school year that that could be achieved. But PD days are important. You know, not um, I'm not here to uh, in any way diminish the impact it could have on a Friday for a family of 
particularly for single parents, new Canadians, it's tough. And I think school boards need to take every effort possible to give as much advance notice at the beginning of the year for those days and as much support for those parents who may need it. But I will say, ensuring continuous professional development is imperative if, uh, you know, it's almost existential to the future of education. And we need our educators to be highly trained in the literature and the evidence. The new language curriculum is a case, a great case study. The Ontario Human Rights Commission last year issued a report on the right to read, suggesting the former government's curriculum, a partisan comment, just factual, that for whatever reason, it left out many core elements that are important when it comes to building, uh, strengthening reading instruction and proficiency in writing. Uh, the evidence suggested that, you know, cursive writing uh, created a much more effective impact on seamless creativity when it comes to writing. Uh, and likewise, phonics as an approach to reading. And so we've really embraced those experiences and that advice by going back to those the basics, if you will, on what has worked for generations. And so I think, um, I think those types of reforms are going to be critical as we look forward. And never forgetting that, you know, uh, this is not meant to be a static enterprise. It's, we need to continuously encourage our educators to the profession on their own. So much so that I have funded for free our AQs, which are essentially um, a form of higher learning for educators. And as they gain more AQs, more of these, uh, uh, these, uh, these essentially small modular course, module courses, they actually have higher pay. So I'm trying to incentivize them by paying for the training, increase your salaries and your competitive experience, because I believe we have a challenge when it comes to the mathematical competence of new educators. We, we've seen the research. There's many of them that are not at the grade nine math standard. So I've imposed a new grade nine math standard, um, and we're taking a variety of steps going forward uh, to make sure these PD days uh, are effective as they are intended with the minimal impact they have on parents and Ontario. Now, my wife was always, uh, I mean, we were very involved in our kids' schools. There was a, uh, and we're talking, our, our kids are in their 40s now. So uh, 25, 30 years ago, there was quite a thing for parent involvement. Parent councils were very big. Uh, my wife served on the parent councils of all the schools that our kids were in. Uh, and then, and that led us, well, Wendy's belief in uh, those things that you're talking about phonics and cursive and everything that right. led to us supplementing uh, instruction at home with, uh, you know, we would read to kids, our kids, and we would, we would have them write little stories about it. Um, what's happened to parent involvement? Is that, is it stronger than ever? Is it weaker than before? Uh, where, and where's it going? It needs to be stronger. I think in short bear, I mean, you know, F.E. Trent, uh, Stephen Crawford, Natalie Pierre, the members from Paulton, they've all shared with me, from their communities, a strong desire, um, you know, to see parents' voices better embedded within our education system. Because, you know, there's been, you know, for some time, some usurping of those perspectives into government. And, you know, we're here to represent the people, but ultimately we're here to ensure that the voices of parents are heard. And I think that's important. I think it's actually fundamental to our roles as public office holders. I appreciate consulting. Sometimes town halls could be ruckus, it could be tough, but we are here to face the music. We have to hear from the perspectives of those we serve. So my, my answer is it needs to be stronger. And that's why through the new bill, Bill 98, the Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act, we actually by law require school boards to build a school improvement plan that is exclusively focused on provincial priorities. For the first time, I now have the authority to set out a provincial priority on academic achievement. We are going to bind boards to adhere to a focus on reading, writing, and math and academic achievement as the central mission of their existence. I will hold them accountable through the public facing release of those metrics. We will hold directors accountable uh, by tying their performance uh, uh, to uh, their, their school board's adherence to those plans. And frankly, I believe parents want to know. Are my kids' schools better off when it comes to reading, writing, and math and STEM disciplines? So this bill gives us the accountability on school boards and refocuses our school boards on what matters most, that academic achievement, that student success component. Um, and I think it's so critical that we not lose sight of what we're here to do in schools, which is to build a very skilled group of young people that can really go off and achieve anything. And so uh, 
feel is, is fundamental to our success. And so for any parent who feels that at times their voices are not heard, the new bill we just passed that's been strongly supported by your members like Effie and, and, and Stephen Crawford, both of whom uh, were fierce advocates for this provision, it now binds school boards to hold twice annual consultations with parents to build their academic achievement plans. It's not mm -hmm. a, a choice, it's now the law. And I expect them to do so, I know they will, in good faith, to hear from the diverse perspective of parents we represent. That's, that's the first principle. Parents raise their kids. I want those values, those voices to be embedded into the system as we build them on the ground. So that sounds like you're shifting to almost a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, uh, kind of consultation away from the group consultation where parents used to be funneled through the school council. Does that mean the school councils are, I mean, I, I lost track in your answer whether we whether school councils are going up or down or staying the same or where that's at. The council will remain. I mean, school councils are important as a way of engaging parents. I just look more at a more macro level, Mayor. I'm trying to address the sort of the underpinning of your question, which is, you know, are voices of parents sufficiently embedded within the education speed at the school board, the school level, the board level, or the provincial ministry? My answer to all of the above is it should be stronger. I, I think parent engagement councils or these um, parent councils are, are actually very important because they provide critical services at all terrorism, leadership, they do fundraising, they often do a lot of the extracurricular supports. So they, they play a great role. And I want to thank parents for the sacrifice they make literally daily uh, to raise and love their kids. But um, uh, I do think at a more holistic level, those voices, those 8, 10, 15 voices, we need to amplify them. And I don't need just the principal to hear it. I want the director to hear it. I want the superintendents to hear those voices. I want the trustees to hear those voices. And I think many of them do make that effort. I just want to make that the systemic reality in every board, in every school, in every region of this province. Well, you you may have just had the last word because we've only got a few seconds left. Uh, I want to I want to hone in on your last word opportunity by saying that micro approach where you get the individual uh, student learning plan strikes me as a best practice because it reminds me of what happens at the best corporations with every employee. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 10 seconds that are left, I think I'll just have to, uh, I think I'll only be able to say thank you very much for giving us the time you gave and the, and the answers. I, I, I can't remember a minister who's been so frank and forthcoming. Thanks very much for watching, and I hope you'll join us again on Oakville Matters. Thank you.